<laughs> Welcome this evening uh, to our study circle. We are going to discuss David Harvey's The Condition of Postmodernity. We have here Patrick Hettula, Martin Squasima, Frederick Peterson, and me, myself, Holger Weiss. And one has to say that as a starting point that we are discussing one of the classics in both Marxist geography as well as one of the groundworks that kind of opened for a spatial term. Harvey, David Harvey is distinguished professor at the Graduate Center at City University of New York. He has a long background uh, as a geographer, but he is of special importance also for historians to open up one's mind to include space in one's consideration and not only focus on the on the time factor. And of course for me uh, coming in into Harvey uh, and the whole spatial term was by reading Karl Schlegel's Im Raum lesen wir die Zeit, Schlegel kind of emphasized that we have background thinkers for the spatial turn. It's Henri Lefebvre, who will come up also in this book. We have Edward Soja, who started to publish his monographs on third space and others after Harvey had published The Condition of Postmodernity. And Schlegel kind of says that these, Lefebvre, Harvey and Soja, laid the ground for researchers in the humanities to integrate a kind of, or to refocus and take space seriously. Uh, about the book, we have put on our homepage the excellent summary of uh, Harvey's The Condition of Modernity by Patrick Mooney. The summary is a very good one to start with, but I would say that, as also Mooney underlines that, reading the book is really enjoyable. Uh, because, I mean, Harvey is also, as an author, it, it's, it's a joy to read him. Tonight, we would focus on part three, which I think is, for us here, uh, and for the Global History Laboratory, is the kind of, from a theoretical and from a mythological perspective, the most kind of intriguing and, and challenging chapter. I think the chapters, uh, part one, passage from modernity to postmodernity in contemporary culture is a kind of interesting challenge to what at that point was a kind of crucial onslaught to uh, modernity and the modern project and so in society uh, through uh, postmodernity and, and, and Harvey gives this kind of very critical opening and, 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 and his discussing about what is actually going on when we speak about postmodernity and so on. Part two, the political economic transformation of late 20th century capitalism is, I think, we can go, come back to that part as a footnote, is that Harvey, Harvey wrote his book in the late 80s, the book is published in the year 1990, and reading his kind of analysis of the late 20th century what struck is that so much is still in place of his uh, kind of notions, especially of flexible accumulation and mm -hmm. all what comes with it. I mean, we, in a sense, we, we're st still in this phase. And we might end up with part four, which is, of course, part four, the condition of postmodernity is, is, uh, is a way of kind of looking ahead and we see if we have time to discuss that. But I think that we're going to focus on part three because, for me at least, that, that's when it's really kind of said, okay, now here, this is the reason why Harvey is always referred to when we speak about the spatial turn and his discussion and integration of space, time, and what follows from that. And maybe I open the discussion by going to page 218. This is a long jump because that's, that's like, in a sense, he summarizes a more theoretical and methodological approach 
by integrating and discussing Henri Lefebvre's three dimensions of space, experienced space, perceived space, and imagined space. And then kind of putting into this discussion also uh, remarks and, and kind of extensions by Bourdieu, Deserto, and, and others leading up to Table 3.1, a grid of spatial practices, which I think then we might have a lot to discuss about. In a sense that, but maybe to, to add to the three dimensions identified by Lefebvre, the experience space, the perceived space, and imagined space, we have Harvey's uh, additional kind of development of this uh, reasoning by adding four aspects to spatial practices. Uh, first, the accessibility and distanciation aspect, then appropriation and use of space, and the third aspect being domination and control of space, and the fourth one being the production of space. Maybe, maybe we, we could start as a reflection. Patrick, you have been using space in your your work how, how would you kind of go back now to to this kind of classical approach in a sense it's it's always uh, more than 20 years old now <coughs> oh, i think 30 it's years old. Uh, it struck me as uh it was just yesterday that we read lefebvre and thought about his uh trialectics of space and his uh, three categories of of dividing up space, uh, in, but it's in a matter of also producing space, which has to be uh, considered when thinking about these three. Uh, but there was on one page in Harvey that he had the the epiphany that dominating space is also producing space. It flicked in front of my eyes and it was something that really resonated with me and also took me back to the days when we were trying to understand Lefebvre and trying to understand in a way the, the setup is different from Lefebvre's implementation because Lefebvre goes then on into pr production of space and into kind of a active role f for agents as producers of spaces and also that that is that is an opening for people in a, a margin of society where they can start producing a space of their own, but it's based in some kind of a knowledge of space. M maybe in this particular case, knowledge of the, the imagined space, mm -hmm. because in a way, the imagined space is the space where the opportunities have or the opportunities are, but nothing has been written down yet. Everything is still in the mapping phase where you associate yourself with your environment and start to imagine political future or or even more practical in a practical sense infrastructure in harvey this grid when thinking of what happened in the next 20 years with the internet revolution and if you if you then read his uh, spaces of representation which are considering the imag imaginative field of space, where you have these utopian plans, imaginary landscapes, science fiction and ontologies and space, artists' sketches, mythologies of space and place, mm. poetics of space, spaces of desire, mm. and then you would put internet <laughs> there as kind of something that this summed up to <coughs> in the next... 20 years or where we are today mm -hmm. I don't think that we could speak of this kind of a space without mentioning the internet and the possibilities that we are experiencing in this kind of a virtual space that we mm -hmm. have today mm -hmm. but this was my first uh, reflection upon reading Harvey and reflecting on what we have been reading on space yeah for me I think uh, because I'm really new to space but um, um, I'm really interested in uh, the isms of the evolution of society. And when Harvey tries to put together 
um, the understandings of modernism and postmodernism. I, I, I enjoyed his um, analysis of, of modernism in the representation of what the city meant to him. Uh, a city as a theater, a city as a, as a co-created space by different actors which can devolve in, in a twinkling of an eye into a chaotic environment, so to speak. And so coming back into the relationship between modernism and postmodernism, and then when I try to infuse the understanding of space into into the isms, I see this interplay, this very interesting interplay between uh, how space is being produced, how space is being produced by actors, especially thinking about the evolution of the co-creation of space from modernism to postmodernism. And as my colleague Patrick has stated, when I also think about how the internet today, as at de that time, was considered like a future possibility, he also speaks about to be a modernist, you have to be a, a creative destructor, or, or you have to practice creative destruction, so to speak. And how space would have evolved in the internet if the argument for enlightenment and modernism would have evolved, you know, considering the internet today. He helps me as a, as a young historian, even though I'm a futurist, in understanding the evolution of, of postmodernism in its abstract state and, and how it relates to, to space. Frederick, um, you have also been working with space. I mean, yes. uh, what, what, what does space mean for, for in, in your research? And what would what would the production of space mean in uh, for you? The, the 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 idea of a production of space, I would, it's kind of what happens within that space, and what kind of connections can we see? And I would also like to add the, the idea of place here, so also, which I think is really vital when it comes to, as far as I understand, Harvey and his as a source of inspiration for others like uh, Doreen Massey. And you have uh, also Anthony Giddens' thoughts on this, of space and place. And the, the thing that I've been thinking a lot about the, in the last weeks is how we put this into practice and into our research also, and how we implement it in more fruitful and constructive ideas. And that's why we, re we read this kind of works also, I think. But uh, the connection between Harvey and Massey, because I've been reading Massey now the, the latest week and also forcing my students to read it. <laughs> but th that's when you, when you get to the fundamentals of it, it, it's all about what is happening in these spaces and how do we decode them, I think. And what does it mean to us when we try to interpret it in our own research? But I, I would like to get back on this further on in this discussion, absolutely. I, I will throw some more quotes from, from Harvey's text, because I, and if we are still on page 218, where he says that, and if it is true that time is always memori memorialized, not as flow, but as memories of experienced places and spaces, then history must indeed give way to poetry time to space as the fundamental material of social expression. The spatial image, particularly the evidence of the photograph, then asserts an important power over history. What do you want to make out of, of this? Well, first of all, I think he gives a concrete uh, entry when he wants to address this space and place because, for example, the, the evidence of the photograph, how do, what do we make out of that assertion or assumption? I mean, as historians, we work with a lot of different types of sources when we try to understand the experiences of places and spaces and what do they mean to us and to others. It's very hard for me to even think about historical time as a chronological time or as linear or circular or anything without thinking space. But I'm unsure if that is something that has been 
implemented by time, by reading upon space, and becoming more spatial aware, is there a kind of divergence when this became the norm for remembering, to think in, in terms of space and time? As historians, I might be one of those who thinks that my agents in my research thinks about their own environment in spatial and, and temporal dimensions and also remembers their past uh, in a spatial and temporal way. But I'm a little bit critical if this is actually experienced by everybody. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm posing a question here. Mm. That is this kind of space and time experienced as we and how are we and Lefebvre supposed that people experience, is this something that is superimposed in a kind of a postmodern environment, postmodern mm -hmm. reading of history and reading of our surroundings? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, and then coming back, because I thought that Martins had a point that if, if you take internet as, a, as an example, just in a way it's become a very free space of expressions mm -hmm. and ideas mm -hmm. and this uh, utopian landscape where mm -hmm. everything is possible. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there are people who you could actually argue that are modernists that are trying to, in a way, go back to, to enforce a structure on in the internet, mm -hmm. to enforce laws and enforce this kind of a rigid system to control the internet, which in turn makes, also raises the question that if this is an attempt to control this space, it's also producing a kind of new space with these laws and structures and, in a way, a grid. So I, I, I will throw you some even further kind of <laughs> reflections in, into mm. our discussion, which is a good thing when you have a study circle, you <laughs> don't have to lecture. Um, <laughs> no, you have, you have to think. <laughs> and, and, of course, the question is, for space, is the question of the present, which, in fact, is an impossibility because uh, the present is now and here. But when I have spoken the word, it is already history, which means that <coughs> is space then future or is it the past? And of course we can say that the moment that we live here now might be the present. At the same time, as I'm articulating and trying to formulate my thoughts and so on, I'm still somewhere in the past, while at the same time I'm trying to formulate ideas, find words and expressions, and to kind of give a projection of the future by formulating a sentence and so on. And then when I speak the sentence, I have made a future projection, but when, I, when I've spoken it out, it is already history. But it becomes, of course, problematic then, uh, in the sense of, take as an example, both the photograph or the, the map or the, the recorded session like this is that which Harvey later on in the text speaks about pulverization and, and, mm. and kind of a decomposition of, of the present. Mm. Uh, but we could also say that the, <clears throat> that the space that we try to fill up here, which of course uh, is surrounded by walls and, and the walls are make up then a building and, and, and so on. But, but within these walls we have thousands of ideas that we try to formulate, some of them come out, come, come not out. So, so in a, we, we are already kind of living in, in, in a multispatial space. If the thoughts that we, that we have around us and, and might be space, might, might be something else, when we, when we try to order them, we exclude some, we put some away and, and we, we sort out and, and we mm -hmm. make only a small portion out of the, the possibilities that we have in mind mm -hmm. come out. Mm -hmm in a spoken word. Then we take the recorded session and we decide that we cut away five minutes out of ten minutes. Nowadays with the photo uh, we might uh, reuse the image for a total different purpose. We might put it in a total different content which gives it a total different meaning then again. I was thinking about the, the, the discussion about the, over time, and especially 20th century history, the more connected things are getting, and internet, for example, the more fragmentation we have to adapt to. And that kind of connects to what you're talking about, Holger. The, 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 the possibilities to select, the 
possibilities to omit and delete what shall we keep and what shall we not keep and what is happening exactly in the past, the present and the future. I mean, the, the, the thought process is a continual process of fragmentation, perhaps, that yeah. creates and enables the production of space and what we choose to fill in that space. I think uh, connections lead to fragmentation, hmm. actually. That's uh, how I feel about it when we just sit and discuss it like this. I think, I think it's very interesting because now what I'm hearing is, uh, in a way, fragmentation that ends up becoming creation. But, but it's, uh, in the summary that we had on our web, web homepage, um, there's this point that said, especially talking about um, Hogo's point on frozen time, uh, Harvey argues that neither space nor time can be understood outside the context of social action. I try to 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 put that into context in thinking about the creation of of space <laughs> like from the practical example we have from Hoga thinking about a representation and uh, Harvey also speaks about the Lefebvre's three dimensions the last two are very interesting to me it says representations of space and uh, spaces of representation <coughs> those are very very a tricky play on words mm. but then how to bring it into context like we, we we represent space then the spaces of representation and if he argues that we cannot understand space or time without the context of social action then that's very very striking spatial theories i'm very interested with the abstractions that are easily ignored in definitions of space what's going on in my mind what's going on in my brain <coughs> the internet is another good example and how to infuse Harvey's idea of uh, social action in that I mean you 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 you, you are highlighting uh, what Harvey is writing on page 223 mm. last sentence mm. on the page. but since it is fundamental it is a fundamental axiom of my inquiry meaning Harvey's inquiry the time and space or language for that matter mm. cannot be understood independently of social action mm. which is of course important to integrate social action within a discussion also aesthetical discussions aesthetic kind of thinking of mm. Space, space and time. Mm -hmm. Actually, there isn't that much new that is created, although the fragmentation, I, I totally agree upon, on this kind of uh, a community, a collective, supposedly creating content, mm -hmm. but actually in a collective way or in a kind of beehive way, reproducing quite a lot of the same kind of content. In, in the context of the web, and thinking about Harvey's idea of the inability to understand space without social action, I just have this general question. How, you know, the web as a as, as, as space, anyway, uh, becomes a platform for both fragmentalization and creation of more space, but then how do we understand social action? from that perspective of creating more spaces, even in that abstract space, so to speak. I think the issue is that people are conditioned into understanding their, their spaces and social spaces and practices in social spaces. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a question of conditioning. And this is very, this is more clear when you have a cultural collision of, mm. of sorts. The differences are, more or less about what you experience, mm -hmm. what you understand, mm. and what you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And then it conditions your activity exactly. in the space. But, but you can also, I mean, in a sense, for me the internet and, and cyberspace is just another dimension. If you think 500 years back, networks, connections, uh, spaces did exist, but they were of course much more unstable, it took much longer time to be, to reach out, to connect, to spread one's word. Of course, the 
printing machine is one revolution in the sense of spreading out the word. You, you can kind of, uh, instead of writing a letter, which is then read by a limited amount of people, you, you, you print your book and you start to disseminate it. Yeah. Uh, of course, Harry would say that, that connected with the printing machine is always somebody, meaning the bookseller, who will sell the book. And, and the printer is also demanding money for you to, to print your your manuscript and so on. And, and it, although you might have an idea of it, you're going to say humankind or have you or whatever it is, you don't want to have money, you need money to get your book printed. But once it's printed and people have bought it, have read it out, most, if you, 500 years ago, they would listen to it, much more fewer would, would read it, and then they would start to, to kind of through through the space that is kind of compressed in a book and the ideas and, and if 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 words are also spaces and, and 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 in a book you have tons millions of small spaces being kind of mm. combined mm -hmm. the way of spreading your ideas and through that enabling social action because if you, if you write a political pamphlet you want people to either listen or to read, and then take action. In that sense, of course, the internet provides now the possibility that you, in theory at least, have erased both time and space. Mm -hmm. Because you can put anything you want on the net, on cyberspace, which anybody, anywhere, can read at any time. And that, that's, of course, in theory, but uh, then in practice there might be obstacles still. But but for me, the internet is the kind of third dimension which enables time and space to be simultaneously present. I was thinking of what you said earlier, Holger, about what we can experience, that the present is uh, hardly ever experienced, although paradoxically it's the only time we experience because we can't experience the past or the future but in a way we are especially as historians we are constantly revisiting the past everybody is also in a way imagining in the future <coughs> all the time the brain is constantly working working <coughs> towards that <coughs> but what I was thinking about what what has during the modern and postmodern and, and and also the internet age what has changed is the way we can revisit the past, the way we can accumulate information, not only photographs, but we can we can film and internet as a, a database for storing your memories has re revolutionized the way we revisit the the past. I think, mm. and I, and this this I can experience from my own, my short life. I can still remember the times when revisiting or even experiencing what I did uh, on birthdays was a matter of looking at photographs or maybe uh, VHS tapes. But still, it was, it was very much more difficult than today, where you can pick up your phone and, in a way, capture every moment if you think it's worth remembering in the future. And this, in a way, has made the present, the present, in a way, a longer experience. But but then at the same time, the internet makes us totally focus on the present. When we create our homepages, whatever, mm. the homepage is, it's pretty much, in in how it would a being. Of course, with the intention of becoming, mm. but it has no history usually because usually. When we, when it, it's getting too old, we change it without storing it, usually. Usually uh, we kind of update our profiles or whatever and so on, mm -hmm. but the used material is usually then thrown away in the container. You might have three, four, or even only one picture of your family and so on taken 50 years or 100 years ago and that that might you might keep but it is one single moment of a, a myriad of other moments that could have been 
kept, but we are never kept out of several reasons. And of course, one reason that we had to kind of bring back Harvey into discussion is, of course, that, that time and space has a third factor, which is money. And, and you, there is always the question of with time and with space comes the connection to power. If time and how is playing around with time is money, uh, space is as much money because if you control space, then uh, you can control or at least attempt to control time. And through that, you can make out capital, uh, uh, profit, whatever you want to do off anything. You, you, and this is also the famous idea that in, in, a, in a natural stage, if you would think in other ways, uh, land would have no value. Of course, I mean, Harvey is a Marxian, and, and I think he has a very powerful argument that, that he brings in, in in his spatial analysis, is that we cannot kind of detach the question of power, of control. And of course, in, in the moment when you try to control space and time, you have a counter-reaction to it. I mean, that This would be Lefebvre's reading, but, but also Harvey's reading was is that, that it, it is, in a sense, an, an, an impossibility. It's, it's the impossibility of the modernist project, but it's also the kind of, in a sense, the impossibility of the postmodernist project. You know, the counter movement is, of course, which Harvey also notes, is that, that history comes back in, religion comes back in, to give the individual a place and a space somewhere in time where, where everything seems to be lost. So kind of a, a space and place someone can refer to, uh -huh. to feel connected to something in the present. Or in the present, by, but by using the past or by, or by using uh, these kind of ideas or, or whatever you want to call it, religion and, and so on, which during the, the modernist phase yeah. were kind of fading away. I mean, because you were so kind of focusing on building up the modern society, mm -hmm. which was to be calculated, which was to be planned. There was no room for the kind of for either God or some, somebody else interfering and so on, because mm. it, there was nobody interfering. It, it, mm. it was human, and, and especially those who were in, in control or thought they were in control of time and space, who had the power to plan. And also the next step was then to create. But how, do you, uh, how do you read Harvey and also the, the notion of space being in a way a commodity that uh, a resource th that won't go on forever? Because I read it, you know, I read Harvey in a way that, that the, the transition from modernity to postmodernity also read in the notion of modernity always accumulating more and without the, the sense of resources emptying out. Mm. Uh, whence the, the postmodern turn also brought in the, the issue of uh, resources, of space, of, of people. Uh, accumulating the whole planet. I think that, that Harvey is, is pointing out because it all goes, back, goes down to money, meaning capital. You're speaking about destruction and capital kind of to expand needs to destroy, to create something new. Mm. But capital is also highly consumerist because both the destruction, meaning you destroy something that has been created already, if the modernist idea of these infinite possibilities have been shaken. And Harvey doesn't say that, that we are kind of, that some of the postmodern critique of Fordism and, and modernization and so on are not valid. I mean, he is, he is clearly focused on that, that, that some of the kind of arguments about the finite spaces, and especially if you speak about ecology, environmental issues, and so on. There are certain limits which natural space kind of gives us. I mean, we have only one planet, Earth. Mm -hmm. And if the creation through the destruction, which the accumulation of capital is all about, and, and going on on an even faster and faster pace, that we are kind of having a big problem. Mm -hmm. And the question is that how to resolve that problem. And of course, there is no answer, neither is there an answer given in this book, nor is there an answer given by, by economists or so on, because they would say there will be a technical solution in, in the future, because that we know from, from the past is that we come to a kind of 
threshold point, a kind of a crisis which creates something new. Mm. If this is the case and something new happens, then we have a new space and the question is who control, controls that space. <coughs> so if we think about this, I see the internet or the web space as the ultimate representation of modernism, where we create by destroying, so to speak. And so, <laughs> so somehow um, it seems to me like, Patrick, you, like you asked the question, if it's ever going to be depleted or if it's going to ever end. And if I think from the abstract sense, I see the destruction of space as still part of our present, part of the present time, part of what evolves continuously. And it's difficult to think about how we will ever evolve beyond that, In even though there have been arguments on sustainability and when how sustainability fits in to to a postmodern world. And, and that's going to be a challenge, I think, for historians, especially when we think about, you know, the re-evolution of, 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 of space and how to, how to define the coordinates of how space should be understood from my, from my own thinking. And so, so from, from this perspective, I think, I think it's a very interesting line of thought. I just wanted to comment on, on what Frederick said earlier on the implementation of these kind of spatial theories in our work. As historians, we are creating the spaces of our subjects mm. and in a way that being aware of that is in a way emancipation in itself you are creating the space for these people in this time considering what you know about the the subject but it's still it's it's a it's a created space that you you yourself have created from the postmodern thought the linguistic turn for instance we are all subjective readers we are all subjective thinkers and also projecting ourselves in in everything we do and think and write and read mm. so in a way nothing is changing by me making up this kind of a space and also pointing out a place because historians are always giving the coordinates of a place where then events unfold and people act and and have lived and we tell that story yeah, so it's yeah. in a way it's a storytelling absolutely. method it's also a question of narrative i think um, absolutely and, and yeah. I, I, you mentioned schlegel earlier Holger. he also wrote in another book on moscow much about this creation of spaces is about we unify what has been separated over time in different historiographies or the way of history has been written i think and this is a way of understanding and putting pieces together, but from different perspectives. And I, I was reading now here in Harvey's book on page 227, and it's kind of connects to what my research is doing about the movements of resistance and how they, and he writes here in a section about frustrated power struggles, and this is a quote on the part of women, workers, colonized peoples, ethnic minorities, immigrants, and so forth within a given set of rules, generate much of the social energy to change those rules. And I, I think he kind of pinpoints this idea of the creation of a particular space, for example, against something. And there we also have these uh, counter narratives. It gives freedom, but also limitations, I think, mm. which we have to be aware of. I was thinking also that if people aren't erased, mm. but only dis displaced, then a new space will evolve. There will be a production of new spaces for those, even those marginalized. Yeah. As long as people aren't erased, maybe they aren't on the surface yet, maybe we can't write their history yet, but they exist and in the myriad of historical narratives there exist parallel spaces to tell about. But we can also have another kind of idea, which is, we, we, we're thinking about creation and, and destruction and uh, the question of infinite and finite so, uh, resources. Uh, think about that during modernization. Modernization was in a sense that you created something new 
by destroying something old and, and because you you were you wanted to raise the old society if it was let me speak about the social welfare processes by building decent houses and so on in our new society or the postmodern society or the late modern society if you whatever you want to call it the question comes that one counter movement against modernity was that too much was felt to be erased. I mean, you were getting rid of history. I mean, so the counter narrative would be that we have to preserve. Instead of having the internet as the place where we create things, the internet will be the place where we preserve things. In a sense, this is going to be the ultimate archive of all those lived spaces that have been around, whereas we keep on creating something new within the limits that are possible in real life. And, uh, I, I, I come to think about nostalgia when you talk about this preservation and as a counter narrative. You have people and groups who move about and think about preservation and it's also strikes me as a kind of nostalgia that a longing for the past and what was good about the past so why not keep it that way even though that past is gone in the present i think we are talking of maybe several different things here sure, yeah. because there is also the the experience the nostalgic experience on going online that now there is a whole generation that has been brought up with the internet but the internet has been changing so in a way preserving for someone somebody born the, in the 2000s they they might preserve a lot of their memories in, in the in the cloud in the internet cloud somewhere but the the nostalgic experience of experiencing the internet in 2005 as an example it can't really be experienced again without well you would have to have all the set of the, the environment you could emulate it you could mimic it but you can't really experience the internet from 2005 and so there are a lot of these kind of attempts, yes, today. Al already there are attempts of that you can, you can play old games, Tetris and arcade games on, on your computer. And in a way you're experiencing and, and, and revisiting these kind of experiences. But I, I was thinking about the social change and is it possible? I, I, one example is the Arab Spring, I think the dissemination of inf information, the flow of information, at least in the initial phase of that uh, event, the consequences we know today and that in most cases in horrific uh, end results. But the initial phase of that so so social change was made possible due to present day technology and the internet. I would say the Twitter and the Facebook. You have actors who could post online immediately information about it without it going through the usual news agencies and journalists. Now you have the normal person standing as an activist or whatever acting as a journalist. And that is a kind of a change. But isn't this a kind of wave movement? Yeah. First we had this kind of the modernization process uh, plan and kind of attempt to control and, and create a certain type of space. And, and then we had the fragmentation after that still going on mm. in a way that, of course, it is, it is a counter reaction to modernization where the individual, in a sense, is getting lost because it was the collective that, that yeah. was pretty much in focus. Now the focus is on the individual, but it, kind of in a very fragmented world where everyone can be a journalist, everyone can be anything and so on. And now you have a kind of movement towards that to select, to, to, to give back a story, which, I mean, if there are one million voices, whose voice am I supposed to hear? Okay, we close <laughs> to, for tonight, uh, as we can see, uh, reading a classic written, published, uh, Almost 30 years ago, uh, can be read time and again and again and again because there are, there are so many interesting thoughts 
thought-provoking uh, ideas and so on. Uh, uh, but I think that we we will continue our discussion.